Hello everyone. This year is very different for us all and I'm so sad that I cannot be again be in the beautiful city of Lisbon and on stage sharing this event with you all. I'm so grateful to Hugo and his team for making this online version of Experience Agile possible and I am again proud to support the event even while I'm stuck here in Texas. I hope that you're all remaining positive and that you continue to remain hopeful as we weather this storm and that you will all be able to join me and the incredible team as well as the speakers behind this event when I'm back in Lisbon in 2021 where we'll enjoy a fine glass of port together as we bid good riddance to 2020. Cheers. Oh, now I know why I like Lisbon. That's so good. One more sip. Mm. Ah, fantastic. Okay, so last year I introduced the flow system to you all in Lisbon. And since then, there's been a significant change for me. I decided to leave Toyota after many years of working for them in different roles as I wanted to focus on both developing the flow system for use across industry as well as a deeper concentration on organizational design. Given we are all facing the challenges of COVID-19, with many of us questioning whether our lean and agile strategies were fit for purpose, I thought I'd use this opportunity to speak to you about where we might have gone wrong, how we can recover, and where we should be applying our collective knowledge and skills to both survive the challenges and then thrive as we emerge from this crisis. As a huge proponent of lean thinking, I've had to examine its utility as I watch the toilet paper madness grip the world and the shortages of everything from carbonated drinks to critical medical supplies. So what did we do wrong? How could we not respond? How could the richest nation on the planet where I live not be able to support its citizens? Had lean thinking failed us? And was everything I taught now all nonsense? Last year I talked about the phrase VUCA, which has been overused by Agile coaches so much that everyone is sick of hearing it, but it is where we are, a very volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world. What COVID has done is expose the weaknesses in our current systems and process thinking. Supply chains stretch to breaking point, global disruption of logistics, global travel chaos, depressionary economics, low consumer confidence and spending. Even as economies around the world try to reboot themselves, we're still working from home, the virus is not under control with infection hotspots appearing daily and a vaccine seems like Christmas to a child, a very long way off. Nations are already moving to what is known as economic sovereignty. Economic sovereignty is about the over-reliance on any one country, one company or source of supply and the over-reliance on a particular country or region as a market. It's also about the resilience in our supply chains and the abilities of just-in-time manufacturing. We design it in one location build it offshore in another location and then ship it around the planet to sell it to our customers in even more locations. We've leaned out our supply chain so much that any small hiccup in logistics or raw materials will cause the whole system to collapse like a pack of cards. This is not how lean is meant to be used. I think going forward you're going to see a focus on economic sovereignty, ensuring supply chain resilience, a focus on energy security, medical supplies, technology, and of course, financial security. I think across the world, there's going to be a radical change. We are going to have to rethink what being lean and agile really means in the future, and achieving some two-day certification is not going to fix companies and countries. There is a gap we have not yet addressed in all the frameworks, methodologies, tools and techniques and until we do, the merry-go-round of failed transformations will continue with its ine inevitable consequences 
for us all. Before I come to what that gap is, let's look at what we might have got wrong. Ono referred to fake Kanban as a form of supplier bullying. Let's reduce our own inventories and push them upstream to our suppliers and vendors. Our warehouses will be empty and we can repurpose that space. Or better still, let's pocket the cash and sell the building off. The problem with this is you lose all resilience in your own ability to provide for your customers when your supply chain is interrupted. Our first lesson is to use the systems as they were designed and not as we've abused them. Kanban, for instance, is a tool to manage inventory. It's not a team, a board or a methodology. It's the key element of a just-in-time system developed by Taiichi Ono at Toyota. We pushed everything offshore many thousands of miles away from our own capabilities and often just as far away from our customers. And now with the political rhetoric, we're bullying companies to relocate their capabilities to more friendlier nations. With Japan and the US and others demanding we move manufacturing from China to Vietnam or some other country. This is simply shuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. You still have not addressed the problem. Your supply chains are still too lean and your systems have no resilience. Alas, often this is driven by corporate greed rather than a focus on the customer, something companies are still failing to recognise. Of course, we're now seeing agile coaches and others rebrand themselves as resilience coaches. Maybe we'll have a certificate for that soon. This is not what we need. Did we only just realise this? Is resilience something new? I was working on redundant systems, failover, disaster recovery and more 20 years ago. What happened is we became too lean and agile in name only. And more certified experts is not what we need. You also need to understand the difference between resilience and robustness. Resilience is how long it takes you to recover after you've taken a blow. The time to recover to a position of stability. Whereas robustness is your ability to take repeated blows before you fall down. Would it be better to be unaffected by world impacts than to be able to recover from them? The truth is you need a strategy for both, but your survival may depend on your ability to resist for as long as possible. These are some of the brands that have failed due to the impacts of COVID. But in truth, many of them were holding on by the skin of their teeth anyway, and COVID just tipped them over the edge. There are many more at risk, along with companies only surviving through government bailouts. Many are stories of failing to adapt to customer or market changes and demands. Well, that'll be agility, folks, not some software development approach, but business agility. That's the ability of your organisation to determine the appropriate and contextual actions in response to events or stimuli within a time horizon that ensures any response would be cohesive and yield desirable outcomes. OK, in simple terms, knowing what to do and when to do it so that you get the right outcomes. Others have failed to utilise lean as it was intended and instead used it to practice what I call evil lean. That's the practice of reducing your staffing levels to their absolute minimum and then trying to do more work with less people. That's what Sears did before they collapsed, leaving their stores devoid of staff to help customers rather than focusing on what customers actually wanted and needed. Great products and great prices with exceptional service. If you're working more than eight hours a day and also spending your personal time doing work, then you're probably a victim of evil lean. A failure to right-size the company to support its operational needs and to implement the right levels of automation to free knowledge workers to deliver innovation and new opportunities. One of the things the COVID crisis has revealed is the amount of bloat in companies. You know, those bureaucratic processes often referred to as red tape that you were made to follow even though they added no value to the products and services and were only there because someone once created them. 
What we're now seeing as staff are laid off or furloughed is those same companies continuing to operate often more efficiently and effectively without those unnecessary processes. I wonder if we'll bother to bring them back once we resume business as usual. I sincerely hope not. So the key differentiators in the future will not be new frameworks or more processes, methodologies, complete with a certification program. Over the last few years, we've all been trained or have trained others in a cornucopia of frameworks and methodologies. And what's changed? Have companies suddenly become bastions of lean and agile excellence and capability? Have they revolutionized the workplace? Are we all now empowered and truly happy and ready to work the rest of our careers for that single organization? No, not at all. And why occasional unicorn companies have appeared, in the main, nothing has changed. Consulting organizations have come along and rebranded, renamed and resold the same old stuff we've been doing for decades. They've created frameworks and playbooks and sold you magical incantations and special potions that guaranteed they'd make you the greatest lean and agile company ever. But in reality, they're just regurgitating the same old stuff. It's just the emperor in his new clothes. I was recently reading a transcript of the lectures that Edwards Deming, the father of modern quality, gave in Japan where this revolution in quality and lean thinking really started. During 1950 and 51, Edwards Deming delivered a series of lectures in Japan. This was the start of the quality movement that ultimately led to what we call Total Quality Management, TQM, and Total Quality Control, TQC. If you wonder what the difference is between them, TQM is the management principles and TQC the application of them. Deming's lectures were the impetus behind the Japanese revolution in quality, started by the civil communications section, CCS courses, taught by Saronson and Protzman after World War II. Around the same time, a small automotive company was also working on a system of producing products and that system we know today as the Toyota production system. TPS was developed from about 1948 through to 1975, according to the Toyota archives, and was initially focused on cutting costs by eliminating waste, something we refer to today as non-value-added activity. During his lectures, Deming introduced something called the deming Schuett design cycle, and if we look at this, we see some very interesting things. First, it's iterative. You repeat it continuously. And no, this is not PDCA. And to be clear, Deming never created PDCA and said so many times. His own cycle, PDSA, was not published until 1986. And we're in 1951 with this diagram. But if you look carefully at those five points, it starts to look very familiar. This is a product development life cycle. In step one, we create a design and some tests. Maybe we should call this planning. And those tests, they could be called test first. And later we can rename that to something cool like test driven development. Then in step two, we make it, test it internally. Maybe we could call that an MVP. Now that's just an idea you understand, so don't get crazy with this. And the short duration that MVP is being made in feels like a rapid workout that an athlete does. So I'm going to suggest calling that a sprint. But remember, this is just some crazy idea for now. In step three, we release it to the market. And in step four, we get user feedback. Oh, I know, let's call that a customer review and put that feedback in some sort of ordered list to work on later. Now, what could that be called? I got it, a backlog. Yes, a backlog. Finally, in step five, we reflect on what we've learned and the feedback we were given and adapt our planning and designs based on that. That's been very reflective and is looking at or dealing with past events or situations. I Googled that definition and found what we can call it, a retrospective. There we have it the same premise as Scrum and from 1951 with a little bit of XP thrown in. 
As I continued my research, I found numerous instances dating back almost 100 years. And what I found is that with few exceptions, we've learned nothing new. That is not to say we haven't created new tools or better versions of old tools, but we're failing to tackle the elephant in the room. The gap I mentioned earlier and that missing link is human factors. Human factors is the scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions amongst humans and other elements of a system in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. We call that the interactions between agents, machines and people. We sometimes refer to organizations that have achieved this as high reliability organizations or HROs. And you'll see this demonstrated in military and in areas such as patient healthcare. A mark of a great HRO is their ability to operate in complex, high hazard domains for extended periods without serious accidents or catastrophic failures. They do this not by following a framework or some specific methodology, although exceptional skills and continuous learning and training are necessary prerequisites, but they do this through something almost all lean and agile approaches fail to teach, and that's teamwork. Sure, we tell everyone you need to be a team and the frameworks all state you need teams. And some even claim they're a team-based system. But other than this cursory nod to teaming, they fail to actually teach you how to be a team. We throw some hapless souls together and announce we are now in agile teams, but we do nothing to teach them how to be a team. Now let's be clear, teamwork training is not building marshmallow towers with pasta sticks in a retrospective, and that's not actually what a retrospective is supposed to be used for anyway, nor is it being, a, being locked in some escape room for 60 minutes. Teamwork training must be contextual and involve the actual work we do as a team, not some abstract construct. But hey, Tuckman told us teaming was simple. We start by forming, and then we storm until we norm, and apparently then we begin to perform. But amusingly, they added adjourning more recently, which is what most of us do when thrown into a team we can't function in. We keep ourselves to ourselves, and we become a team of individuals hardly high performing. Organizations that succeed going forward are those that recognize this gap and close it, not the ones who learn yet another methodology from a self-styled fake university. In the early days, Deming focused on process, and that formed the basis of many years of his teaching. He himself failed to address human factors until later in his career, but after years of trying to solve the issues of failing companies and transformations, he realized that unless he too addressed the elephant in the room, nothing could change. This led him to create his system of profound knowledge, underpinned by his 14 points of management. He described the profound knowledge as the route to transformation and the 14 points as the application of it. I reviewed Deming's 14 points of management from his 1986 book, Out of the Crisis, a quite prophetic title, don't you think, given we're all talking about emerging from a crisis now. What I found is that everything we as coaches and trainers now profess as our wisdom Deming had clearly defined for us 34 years ago based on his preceding 36 years of wisdom. That's 70 years of saying what we all claim to be new news. The key points Deming made were simple. Implement distributed leadership by empowering workers to make decisions. Build quality in by testing continuously and not in some QA department. Practice continuous improvement and continuous learning. Enable a safe to fail environment with psychological safety. Eliminate the barriers between silos and abandon platitudes and cliches which form empty mission and vision statements. Stop using KPIs and focus on value creation. Discontinue individual performance appraisals and put everyone to work, even managers. 
Now I've summarized those modern interpretations for you, but you should read them for yourselves and recognize that what you think is new knowledge, we've known for decades. The key element of human factors is behavior. And by behavior, I mean the way we all behave. I often hear people talk about needing to develop a new culture and that we all need to adopt an agile mindset. What utter nonsense. Culture is a product of our behaviors. Culture cannot be planned or curated. It emerges based on how we interact with each other and how we behave. When people talk about creating the right culture, they must mean changing how we behave. Either that or they don't know what they're talking about. And that mindset thing, you can't teach a mindset and force adoption of one. You can outline a philosophy and people can choose to align to it. And if you then guide appropriate behaviors using enabling constraints, you can work, work towards achieving that philosophy. Expect it to change as you grow and learn, however. Mindsets are also emergent. They are defined as the established set of attitudes held by someone. So you can only influence and not create a mindset in someone. And remember, we seek open minds, not closed or fixed thinking. If your organization is to succeed, it must change its behaviors. And that starts at the very top with the leadership. It's no good a group of workers running around shouting a bunch of lean and agile terms if the people who manage them are living in a different universe. To truly transform the way you do things means changing the way you think, the way you act, and most importantly, the way you behave. People who try to copy Toyota do it with one fatal flaw. They simply copy tools and methods and ignore the requisite behaviors. Alas, that's what many of you are doing when you implement lean and agile tools. You all learn how to use a brand new hammer and you run around wildly hitting things and wonder why all you end up with is a horrible mess. This is why case studies are nothing more than glossy sales brochures for consulting firms. It worked there, so of course it will work here. And that's more utter nonsense. Context is key and there are no one-size-fits-all frameworks. To quote Deming, American management thinks that they can just copy from Japan, but they don't know what to copy. When we created the flow system, it was to provide you with a system of learning and understanding. It was designed to help you understand that to be successful, you need to build upon a lean foundation by embracing complexity thinking, new distributed leadership styles that truly empower your workers in a safe to fail environment and to leverage human factors through team science. Looking back to the great minds and the wisdom of the last century, I see that we may have created a consolidated guide to everything they were telling us and others were choosing to ignore. Time will tell if we made a difference. So my message to you this year is to stop throwing even more lean and agile tools at the problems and instead start focusing on developing your people and that starts at the top. Understand complexity, develop distributed leadership teams and capabilities and transform into a high reliability organization by utilizing team science. Lean is not a silver bullet being fired by a unicorn named Scrum that's leaping over an agile rainbow. They are simply tools that humans use, but without the right behaviors, they're as useless as a chocolate teapot. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you live and in person in 2021. Cheers. Damn, that's good.